Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode in my midweek mystery series where today I'm going to be sharing another story of an unidentified serial killer. As he was dubbed by the media, the Eastbound Strangler or the Atlantic City serial killer is thought to be the perpetrator of the murders of four women near Atlantic City, New Jersey in October and November 2006. 15 years on and there are still no answers. It seems that as the years have gone by, this is a case that has all but been forgotten about, both the victims and the murderer. But this year there was another small burst of interest when the crimes were mentioned as part of a Lifetime movie about the Long Island serial killer, the movie suggesting a possible link between the two, which I will of course dive into later in the episode. It's never too late to get answers. These crimes didn't even happen two decades ago. There's every chance if the right person hears the right bit of information, they could hold the key to unlocking all of this and finally getting justice. That is why it's so important to share these stories to not forget. Sadly, there isn't loads of information about this case, but I'm gonna share everything I can. Even being from the UK, I know that Atlantic City doesn't always have the best of reputations. Going into this case, what I knew of the city was based off of what I'd seen in movies and TV shows, some sort of dodgier Vegas knockoff, casinos, bars and hotels dominating the land. I don't know if that's accurate or not, every city, every town around the world has its good and bad areas. I did of course do a bit of internet research and as is always the case with the internet, there were a lot of opposing views of Atlantic City. Atlantic City is a coastal resort city in Atlantic County, New Jersey, USA, known for its casinos, boardwalk and beaches. As of 2020, the city had a population of nearly 38,000 people, but of course it's also a tourism hotspot. According to the Visit New Jersey website, it hosts over 27 million visitors each year, making it one of the most popular tourist destinations in the United States. That's a lot of people, it's a lot of movement, a lot of people who could be considered suspects in this case, like searching for a needle in a haystack. It was the 20th of November 2006 when the bodies of four women were found in a ditch in Egg Harbor Township about 50 yards behind a motel called the Golden Key Motel in West Atlantic City. It was actually just outside the boundaries of the city. Golden Key was a $15 a night motel, the price reflecting how rough the stay was. It wasn't exactly the kind of place you'd want to stay for a nice holiday, it was a seedy place notorious for drugs and sex work. You definitely wouldn't want to take your kids there to say the least. From what I can gather, the motel has since been demolished. And actually, a ditch is probably too nice a word for where these bodies were found behind the motel. It was more of a drainage canal that runs from the expressway to Black Horse Pike. It was full of rubbish, human and animal excrement and chemical waste. Two women walking that morning came across one body lying face down in the water and quickly called 911. Not long after the first responders arrived, they found the bodies of three other women as well, all within just a few yards. Like the first body, the other three were also all found face down in the water and were about 60 foot apart from each other. It was noted that each of the heads was turned east towards the casinos of Atlantic City, hence the name the killer was dubbed, the Eastbound Strangler. Although it is worth noting that each is also read bounce between the bodies being laid facing each or just the heads being turned east, so do bear that in mind, I couldn't find a 100% confirmation as to which one it was. When I went into this case, I assumed the killer was named so because the victims were found on the side of an eastbound road, and I was quite surprised to find out that wasn't the case. I definitely wouldn't have guessed he got that name because the victims' heads were facing east. We obviously don't know if the easterly direction was a coincidence or not. A lot of organised serial killers can be quite particular though, so I don't want to dismiss the possibility that it was planned. All four bodies, all female, were wearing clothes but no shoes or socks. Based on the levels of decomposition, it's believed that all the women died on different days at the hands of the same person who placed them in the same dumping spot. The death spanned from two days up to a whole month before the bodies were discovered. Two of the victims were so decomposed that a cause of death could not be determined, whilst it was found that one had been asphyxiated and another had been strangled with a rope or a cord. 
The medical examiner also noted high levels of a recreational drug in three of the four bodies. But who were these victims? The first victim of this killer, or at least the first victim of this killer that we know of, is widely considered to be 20-year-old Molly Jean Dilts. Molly had grown up in Blacklick, a small town in Pennsylvania described as a dead-end drug town by many. She never had many friends and she was a very outspoken person, but if you were her friend, you really knew it. She was loyal. An article by Dennis Roddy in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette reads, Molly Jean Dilts was a chubby 20-year-old high school dropout who scrapped and finangled and drank her way through life that began in a used-up coal town and ended up face down in a ditch on the edge of Atlantic City. Close family has admitted that Molly made a lot of mistakes in her life, starting with a harassment charge in 1999 and was crying out for help in the last few months of her life, something which family brushed off as just a phase. But she'd been through it. Her mother died when she was young, her brother committed suicide, and Molly got pregnant as a teenager, giving birth to her son Jeremiah in June 2005. She handed over custody of Jeremiah to her father. That same year, the year before her death, she was charged with drunkenly trying to run over a man in an argument outside a fast food restaurant. She never showed up for court for this and spent the last few months of her life just dodging the arrest warrant. She was transient, she didn't have a home base. She spent time at a homeless shelter in Blacklick, a rented apartment in nearby Blairsville, another in North Philadelphia, until she somehow ended up in Atlantic City, sofa surfing, never having the same place to stay night to night. She also had a drug problem, searches by the authorities of her room at one point uncovered paraphernalia. Likelihood is that she funded the drugs with sex work, locals saying that she would regularly be seen working on street corners. But Molly would be the only one of the four victims without a criminal record for prostitution, so we don't know for certain. But drugs and sex work don't make somebody an inherently bad person. There's one story about one day in Atlantic City, a man was shot in the chest at a bus stop. Molly, not caring about the danger she put herself in, defied the gunman's threats and stayed with the injured man until help arrived, putting pressure on his wounds. She was too scared to show up in court for this to testify though, as she did have that arrest warrant out for her and she was scared of the gunman, but she probably saved this man's life. Molly moved around a lot, she was always back and forth between Blacklick, Atlantic City and anywhere in between it seems. She returned back to Atlantic City on October 7th with a new cropped haircut and new clothes. She told people she'd cut her hair because she was about to go into the military, but she did like a tall tail. For the next few days, she'd be seen wandering the city, it seems, but nobody has an exact date of when she was last seen. Molly's was the last body found on November 20th. She was wearing a denim miniskirt, a bra and a mesh blouse. It's believed that she'd been in the ditch for up to a month and her body was too decomposed to determine a cause of death. The toxicology report showed only alcohol and no drugs in her system at the time of death. Ultimately, she got identified via her distinctive tattoos, including one of her name, which I'm sure helped greatly. The second victim was believed to be 42-year-old Barbara V. Brydor, who, like Molly, had been raised in Pennsylvania, but in a much more affluent area. She had a well-off upbringing and, as an adult, worked in her mother's jewellery shop on the Atlantic City boardwalk, so it was a city she knew really well. In the 80s, her mother sold the business and so Barbara started working as a waitress. It was after that point they said that she got addicted to prescription painkillers and then her life went downhill. She was supposed to have a bright future ahead of her. She was smart, switched on and she dreamed of a career in law. At one point she even studied at Penn State. But the prescription meds sent her down a dark path and soon she was on cocaine, then heroin. This is something that really pains me about stories such as Barbara's. So many people take prescription meds, I assume she was given opioids for an injury or something, and most people can just finish their course, come off fine and go on about their lives. Whilst other people don't have that ability, the people who have addiction running in their veins, in their genes. Barbara wasn't the kind of person you would ever think this would happen to, but it did. Anyone can end up down this same path, all it takes is a proclivity towards addiction and the wrong situation. 
1997, Barbara gave birth to a daughter with her boyfriend at the time, but knowing that she wasn't in a position to raise her child, she ended up giving her to relatives to raise instead. She moved from Atlantic City at some point after this when the boyfriend went to prison for armed robbery, but when he was released, she returned in the hopes of rekindling this relationship. It didn't work, but she hung around anyway. There was more of a chance of making big money in Atlantic City, and Barbara needed big money. Her crack addiction caused her to spend as much as $300 a day. Just like Molly, Barbara didn't have much of a home base. She drifted between friends' sofas, motels, shelters. As so many do, she turned to sex work to fund her drug addiction. Black Horse Pike was her corner of choice. This was an area where a lot of sex workers apparently refused to frequent, knowing the kind of dodgy regulars she would get around there. But Barbara was desperate. And she was also unpredictable, sometimes she would just disappear. So when she failed to return one day on the 17th of October 2006, it took friends weeks to notify the authorities about her disappearance. Barbara was found in the ditch wearing blue jeans and a long sleeve zip shirt. Her body was too decomposed to determine cause of death, but she was found to have a potentially lethal dose of heroin in her bloodstream. It was thought that she'd been in the ditch for at least two weeks when she was found. The third victim was 23-year-old Tracy Ann Roberts. She grew up in Newcastle, Delaware, about 50 miles away from Atlantic City, and dropped out of school at 16 before training to become a medical assistant. She eventually went on to have a child, but broke up with her boyfriend and started using cocaine, occasionally finding herself in Atlantic City. She didn't live there full time, but always found herself back there. After escaping an abusive relationship in the August of 2006, she ended up back in the city in a pretty bad way. She worked in the strip clubs, but eventually found herself on the street. At the beginning of November, Tracy's mum received a call from her daughter asking her to come pick her up. Tracy had been working as a sex worker and a man who wanted to be her pimp had punched her in the throat so hard that she ended up coughing up blood and had to be hospitalised. Tracy had had enough and wanted to go home. So her mum, Joyce, drove the 90 minutes to go and pick up her daughter, but she was just five minutes too late. Tracy had decided to check herself out of hospital in the company of two unidentified men. She was last seen on 15th November 2006, her body found five days later. Because she hadn't been in the ditch as long, the medical examiner was able to find out a little bit more about her death. She died of asphyxiation by unspecified means, and she had a large amount of cocaine in her body at the time. She was wearing a red hooded sweatshirt and a black bra, and her body had been in the ditch anywhere from a couple of days to five. The final victim is thought to have been 35-year-old Kimberly Raffo, known as Kim to everyone. It was her body that the woman first came across on that cold November morning, and Kim's story is perhaps the most surprising of all. It's said that she lived two lives in her 35 years. Up until 2002, she was an upstanding citizen with a family. She'd been born in Brooklyn in the early 70s and in the 90s lived with her husband and two kids. She was your classic PTA mum and volunteered at her daughter's Girl Scouts club. She'd met her husband when she was 14 and they spent the next 15 years inseparable. People who knew her at this time say that she was a Martha Stewart type. But in 2000, the family moved to Florida and after that point, they began to drift. In 2002, looking for some sort of shake-up in her life, she took some classes at a culinary school and there she met a man who she started an affair with. This man was a drug addict and soon Kim went down with him, smoking crack cocaine. Her and her husband obviously split and her husband ended up moving the kids to Ocean City in New Jersey. Kim, desperate to be near her children, ended up leaving Florida and heading to Atlantic City with her new lover. Once there, she worked as a waitress in several restaurants before turning to sex work. It's probably worth noting here that most, but obviously not all, sex workers in Atlantic City at this time were independent. They didn't have pimps. They funded themselves, found clients themselves, and Kim became well known in Atlantic City, both by other sex workers and the police. 
People could see that this wasn't who she was and nobody could understand how she'd ended up in this position. Kim was last seen on the early, early morning of the 19th of November, after she'd visited her favourite diner. This diner would open at 2.30am and all of the sex workers would go and visit before they started their shifts for the night. Kim had her normal breakfast, she had a chat with the owner who knew her well. He said that she was in her normal mood, seeming to be in good spirits. And then she left, walking onto the street and into a black Nissan Maxima with out-of-state licence plates. The next day, her body was found in the ditch, still wearing the same Hard Rock Cafe top that she'd been seen in at the diner the previous day. Her cause of death was found to be ligature strangulation with either a rope or a cord, and she was also found to have large amounts of cocaine in her system. Kim was found to have no defensive wounds on her body, suggesting that she may have been attacked whilst drugged or incapacitated. The other victims also had no discernible defensive wounds, but because of the states of decomposition, we don't know for sure. Kim was also found to have another person's DNA underneath her fingernails, and that DNA is not found to match anyone in law enforcement databases, but of course we don't know for sure that this DNA is that of her killers, it could have been anyone. I don't think even if we did find the person this DNA belonged to, that that alone would be enough for a conviction of anything. Obviously, it took a while to identify all four bodies, but they did get there eventually. And this case has remained cold ever since. There's never been any answers as to who killed them. Police have never named or even had a suspect in this case, but they have identified more than one person of interest over the years. Early on, it was said to be clear to investigators that this was likely the work of a serial killer, although the city didn't want that coming out because that's just a little bit bad for tourism. It took several months before prosecutors conceded that yes, this was likely a serial killer. But I mean, four bodies found in such close proximity, all murdered within the same few weeks, it's kind of the obvious conclusion to make. But more than that, the killings had other hallmarks of being the work of a serial killer. The bodies, as I mentioned previously, were meticulously positioned, all the heads facing in the same direction towards the city, and all of their socks and shoes had been removed, either as a trophy or as part of some kind of fetish. It was speculated that paraphilia played a part in these crimes, a condition characterised by abnormal sexual desires, typically involving extreme or dangerous activities. The killer probably received sexual gratification from being part of these horrific acts. Serial killers often tend to target sex workers as their relatively easy prey, women putting themselves in precarious situations alone in a room with strange men often desperate for money. They often don't have someone waiting for them at home, ready to report them missing when they're not home on time. And as sad as it is, society places no value on sex workers. Society doesn't care when they go missing. So even when they are reported, the authorities are fairly unlikely to actually do anything about it. And serial killers prey on this. So let's take a look at these people of interest that I hinted at a moment ago. A few people have been questioned in relation to this case. A drug dealer and a friend of Kim Raffo and another acquaintance of both Kim and Barbara, but both of these men were released without charge soon after questioning. The day before her death, Kim was with a client in a room at the Trump Taj Mahal Hotel, which has since closed. At about 5am on November 19th, she told this man, a doctor, that she was going to buy drugs and she'd be right back. She never returned, despite him trying to call her several times. Investigators obviously did track down this man and he was cleared through surveillance videos from the hotel and casino. But it was found that the calls that this man made to Kim were routed through to a cell tower on the Black Horse Pike, very close to where the bodies would later be found. There is one name which comes up quite often in this case, and that's the name of a 41-year-old repairman called Terry, who was implicated by a girlfriend as the possible murderer. And he was of great interest to the police from the very beginning of this investigation. I'm just going to give his first name because he was never charged and he says that these accusations have ruined his life. Terry was living in the Golden Keys Motel at the time of the murders for free, in exchange for doing some repair work in and around the building. 
After his girlfriends at the time saw news about these murders on TV, she called police and implicated him immediately. He was then interrogated by police without a lawyer for eight hours, with the police claiming that they knew he was the one responsible. However, Terry has refused to ever admit anything, professing his innocence at every opportunity. He says that him and his girlfriend were in a very bad relationship and she was just being vindictive by giving the police his name. However, when investigators went to his home in Alloway, who was staying at the motel just temporarily, they found a hidden video camera which had captured Terry's stepdaughter in various stages of undress. Terry has denied that he was ever aware of these images, but he did plead guilty to an invasion of privacy charge. All in all, there's nothing by his girlfriend's word to link him to the murders, and he does say that his life has been ruined by these accusations, worried that people think he's a serial killer wherever he goes. Terry did submit DNA, but there was never any forensic match made. And I actually don't know if there was any DNA found at the scene besides what was found under Kim's fingernails, and as I mentioned before, that DNA wouldn't necessarily be that of her killer. The investigation in the early days here was said to be pretty poor. There were four different teams assigned to looking at each murder individually, because the city didn't want it coming out that this was a serial killer. And so this meant that the individual teams often redid what the other teams had done. The same lines of question were followed through multiple times and the same people were talked to. It wasn't very efficient and a lot was probably missed in those early days. You would think that four teams would be better than one, but when communication is bad and all the evidence is pretty much the same because it was obviously the same killer, it's not that efficient at all. Also, because the bodies were found on the outskirts of the city, they actually fell under the jurisdiction of Egg Harbor Township instead of Atlantic City. The Atlantic City investigators would have had a much better understanding of how the sex workers and clients operated within the city. They had contacts, inside information, and that just wasn't utilised. But despite this poor investigation early on, they did also have another person of interest in the form of a man who gave himself the nickname of the River Man, in reference to the Green River Killer Gary Ridgway. This was Eldred Raymond Birchall, who was identified as a suspect by a sex worker. She came forward when she heard him talking about this serial killer nickname. Birchall was a drifter who was in Atlantic City around the time of these murders, and he was well known to have confessed to killing people, but he was never connected specifically to these murders. As far as I could find out, I'm not even sure if he was ever even questioned. And that's about it in terms of people of interest here, there's really little to go on. But criminal profiler John Kelly has meticulously put together a psychological profile of the type of person that he thinks could be responsible for a crime like this. He's worked on profiling killers in some really well-known cases, the Long Island serial killer, the Green River killer, the Golden State killer, and even more. Here's what he has to say about the perpetrator here, and there's quite a lot of it. I'm going to read this almost verbatim from Kelly's website, Stalk Inc. He thinks that the killer is a local male, somebody who's very familiar with the Atlantic City area and the disposal site. These murders happened over the course of several weeks, and whilst some tourists might stay for more than a few days, it's fairly unlikely they'd be there for that long. This was someone who knew the area more than your standard tourist would. He has a very organised personality which instances his personal and everyday activities, including his work. He's structured, everything has a place. He reads books on serial killers and has knowledge of crime scenes and investigations. He's non-social and likes to keep to himself, as well as being narcissistic and making himself look good in every aspect. He's probably extremely opinionated and doesn't like being disagreed with, although he can be charming when he needs to be. The likelihood is, is that he has spoken before about his opposition to sex work, maybe voiced economical concerns about sex work destroying Atlantic City's value or reputation, or said how it's sinful. Maybe he would say that these sex workers got what they deserved. And he would probably follow news of the killings in the media and has a prior record of sexual or physical abuse or harassment towards women. Perhaps not long before the murders, he'd experienced a setback in life, in his career or in a relationship. 
He probably indulged himself with alcohol and drugs and has a god complex. He realises deep in his heart that he is a failure and his narcissism comes from being love and attention deprived in his childhood. An emotional detachment from his father has left him to feel like he is the victim of an overcritical and demeaning mother whose self-destructive prophecy for him he will ultimately fulfil. He tries to kill his self-defeating thoughts and feelings of inferiority through his murderous ways. His female victims may well be surrogates for rage against a wife or a girlfriend. This is likely a person who has killed before and would be compelled to continue. This paranoid serial killer is also a shy guy who is lacking heterosexual social skills. And this lack of such skills results in poor relationships with women. This lack of skills was caused by severe and early childhood trauma, and since he was traumatised in childhood, some of his daily behaviour would be considered extremely childlike and immature by others who know him. He may also have strong religious convictions which propel his rage towards drug-addicted sex workers. Perhaps the most interesting thing Kelly talks about though is a possible foot fetish that the perpetrator may have. He writes he has an extreme foot fetish and has a collection of women's shoes and the shoes of all his victims. As I'm sure you remember, all four victims were found without socks and shoes. He has not killed every sex worker he's come into contact with and there are sex workers in Atlantic City and potentially other places who know him for the sexual gratification he gets from their feet. Kelly also suspects that when he encounters a female acquaintance in his everyday life, instead of a normal greeting, his greeting may include a remark or a compliment regarding her shoes. Remarks along the lines of, where did you buy those shoes? I would like to tell my wife where to get those shoes. He may even be known for offering women foot massages. I do think it's interesting that both the socks and shoes have been removed from every single victim here. I've seen speculation online that perhaps there was no foot fetish at all, that the killer just took them as trophies, but if that's the case, it seems more likely to me that they would just maybe take one shoe or the pair. Taking the shoes and the socks does scream fetish to me. It seems odd to take the socks. But of course, serial killers aren't the most logical of people, so it could go either way. I highly doubt it's just a coincidence that none of them had footwear on. It seems investigators did actually question a guy in the local area who was found to have a foot fetish and a huge woman's shoe collection in his motel room, but that line of inquiry didn't end up going anywhere. There is a lot of speculation about where this killer went after the bodies were discovered. Kim Raffo was discovered within a day of her murder, so I have no doubt that had her body not been found when it was, the killer likely would have continued until the dump site was eventually found. And he would have known that it would be discovered eventually, he wasn't exactly going to huge lengths to hide the bodies. Those two women going on a walk that day probably saved the lives of countless other sex workers in Atlantic City. There's quite a big misconception around serial killers in that they don't have control, that they can't just stop. But the truth is, they can. It's very rare that serial killer exhibits so little self-control that they must keep killing no matter what. Most actually exhibit huge amounts of self-control in a very strange way. Is it possible that this killer just stopped for good after the bodies were discovered? Maybe, but the likelihood is that he just stopped for a while. Maybe he moved cities and continued with the same MO, knowing that the deaths of random sex workers in big cities wouldn't necessarily be followed up on. As Kelly wrote in February 2007, this is an extremely dangerous man who navigates through his life without feeling guilt. He does, however, feel fear. When the women's bodies were found in Egg Harbor, New Jersey, the news sent a wave of fear throughout his entire body. Presently, he is fearful of being arrested and facing life in prison or the death penalty. He is paranoid for good reason. This man is known and has been seen by others, perhaps while searching for a new disposal site for his next victim. If this killer did continue in Atlantic City, it seems he completely changed his MO. Maybe he did start to hide bodies rather than just dumping them. There's also the possibility, of course, that he was arrested for another crime and is currently sitting in jail for something else, or he died. Whatever happened, he did lay low for a while after the dump site was discovered. I have a feeling he moved on, he started killing elsewhere, probably in the years after. 
According to the FBI, there's anywhere from 25 to 50 serial killers operating in the USA at any one time. Or maybe the killer began a family. We've seen time and time again that even serial killers no longer have time for their crimes when they get married, have kids, settle down. If you have heard of the Eastbound Strangler before, the likelihood is, is that you've heard them being linked to the case of the Long Island serial killer, or Lisk, or the Gilgo Beach killer, whatever you want to call them. I have done a video on the Lisk before, which I'll leave linked down below in case you want a full overview on the case after this one, but basically it's another unsolved serial killer that operated in Long Island, New York. According to Google Maps, Atlantic City and Gilgo Beach, about a three and a half hour drive apart, so by USA standards, very, very close. The LISC is thought to have operated between 1996 and 2010, with four bodies nicknamed the Gilgo Four, found within a quarter of a mile of each other near Gilgo Beach in December 2010. But in total, it's thought there's 10 to 16 victims of this killer. Similar to Eastbound Strangler, most of the known victims were sex workers and had been strangled. The possible connection here was first made pretty much as soon as the Gilgo Beach bodies were found, but it was explored further in an eight episode series called The Killing Season on A&E in 2016, and in the 2021 Lifetime film The Long Island Serial Killer and Mother's Hunt for Justice. Despite the similarities, there has never been a solid connection made. Depending on who you ask, they're either 100% related or definitely not, so it is just pure speculation at this point. Maybe the Eastbound Strangler really was just the Lisk on holiday in Atlantic City. Maybe he was a visitor who knew the area well. An officer with the Suffolk Police Department spoke to Oxygen.com in February of this year, saying, We continue to communicate with all enforcement agencies, including Atlantic City Police Department, regarding the Gilgo Beach homicide investigation. At this time, there is no link between our case and the Atlantic City case. John Kelly also agrees that there's likely no link between the two. The Lisk went to great lengths to hide the bodies of his victims, whilst the Eastbound Strangler didn't care. He believed the displaying of the victims' bodies was part of this killer's signature. Interestingly though, it has been found that Molly Diltz was friends with Amber Lynn Costello, one of the Lisk victims. There's currently a $25,000 reward being offered by Stork Inc, John Kelly's company, for any person with information that leads to the arrest and conviction of the individual or individuals responsible for the murders of these women. That was announced back in 2015, however, and there have been no takers. As time goes on, this case gets more and more forgotten about. The motel no longer stands to remind people of what happened behind it. The only way to keep cases like this in the spotlight is to keep talking about them, to not let these victims be forgotten about. These were women who found themselves in an impossible situation. No one ever grows up thinking, one day I'm going to be a drug addict and need to sell myself for money to fund my addiction. But it happens and it doesn't make them any less worthy of justice. Thank you so much for tuning in this week and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.